So I want to welcome everybody to uh, this is uh, the first uh, session of our um, of, of the conversations in global health class for uh, spring of 2021. Um, we have a terrific, uh, for everyone enrolled in the class, as you know, from our first meeting, we've got a terrific group of speakers. And, and tonight's first speaker, Dr. Bruce Gallen, is going to be a great kickoff to a, a, a great semester of, of speakers. So we're, I'm really excited. Um, just a reminder for people who aren't uh, in the class, and we've got a few extra folks here tonight and maybe a few others uh, uh, coming on. The, the format here is that we, we, we invite a, a guest uh, who's a leader in global health to come and uh, engage in a sort of structured conversation with us of, of up to about an hour, maybe a little bit longer. Um, the idea is sort of twofold. One is to get a sense uh, of that person's career and trajectory since everybody here in this class is a, as an undergraduate and trying to map out your own future. And it's always great to hear from people who've been successful in their own career paths. And then second, because of uh, their work to ask some topical questions. Um, so the way this will work is I'll, uh, I'll spend maybe 20 minutes or so in a, starting off with questions uh, with, uh, with Dr. Gallen. And then uh, I'll turn it over to uh, the first wave for classes, uh, questions from uh, students who are enrolled in the class. I'll start with uh, Liddy and Shushuan and Jacqueline, who are the ones who uh, uh, did our briefing emails, uh, and then open it to the rest of the class. And then finally, whatever time we have left, open it up for class uh, for questions uh, for anyone else who has joined us. Um, uh, the, just as a reminder, the, the, uh, the, this, this class session is being recorded. Um, uh, it'll be edited and then we'll post it on the Global Health Initiative website uh, along with the uh, three blog posts that, uh, the, that, the, that, the, that Shishuan and Jacqueline and, um, and Liddy uh, will produce. Um, so we'll have a, uh, uh, that'll be a record for tonight. So, so, uh, uh, so I think before we get started, though, I, I, I thought, uh, well, first off, I, I want to just um, thank my friend, uh, Dr. Bruce Gellin, who is the president of global, I mean, global vaccines at the, at the Sabin Institute. Uh, he has, uh, he and I worked together. He ran for many years, ran the national vaccine program office at the department of health and human services. And in fact, we served together during the H1N1 pandemic when uh, I was at HHS and, and I, I will say this in advance, he's one of the, the, the most effective communicators I know among doctors who are experts. And this, this is a complicated space. And as we are all learning as a world, there, it is a very complicated public health issue to think about how vaccines are delivered. And he's been, he's really gifted at, at, at helping explain these issues. And he's been in the heart of both the domestic and global debate. So I'm really excited about this. But before we do that, I wanna ask everybody who's enrolled in the class, if we could just quickly go around to give him a sense of who everyone is. So just quickly your name, um, the your year uh, and and the program you're in. And um, and, why, and I'm, I'm gonna go off of the, the photo list I have here. So this is not necessarily in, in order here, uh, but let me start uh, first with Kent. You fit. Hi, I'm Kent. Um, I'm a senior in the School of Foreign Service and I'm majoring in science, technology and international affairs, concentrating in global health. Thank you, Kent. And uh, Yumna? Hello, my name is Yemna. I am a first year in the School of Foreign Service and I'm undeclared as of this moment. Uh, Jacqueline? Um, hi, I'm Jacqueline. I'm a freshman in the college and I'm currently undeclared. Excellent. Uh, and uh, how about Lydia? I, I think I've got, I'm so much sure. Hi. Yeah, um, I'm Lydia. Uh, I'm a senior in the college and I'm studying biochemistry and math. Thanks, Lydia. Uh, Liddy? Hi, I'm Liddy. I'm a senior in the college as well, majoring in biology of global health. All right, and Shushuan? Our, our, uh, was at 7 a.m. Uh, good morning to you. <laughs> good evening to you guys. Um, <laughs> my name is Yusha, and I'm a sophomore in the NHS, and I major in global health. Excellent. And Shoa? Hi, I'm Shoa. Um, I'm also a sophomore in the NH in the School of Nursing and Health Studies, majoring in global health. Uh, Sang. 
Hi, my name is Sang. I'm a sophomore in the college uh, majoring in biology of global health. Uh, Kira. Hi, my name is Kirith. I'm a sophomore in the SFS majoring in business and global affairs. Excellent. Uh, Bella. Hi, I'm Bella and I'm a first year in the SFS and I'm hoping to major in, in the science, technology, and international affairs. Excellent. Kayla. Hi, um, we're so delighted to have you. Thank you, Dr. Yellen. Um, I'm a sophomore in the School of Foreign Service majoring in science, tech, and international affairs with a concentration in global health, like a lot of other people mentioned. <laughs> I don't see Samantha unless there's somebody. I don't think she's here. So, so that's so Bruce, you've got a sense of our class. Uh, so uh, we've got uh, people studying science, foreign service, uh, obviously a common interest in global health, but also a number of people here who are undeclared. So, um, so welcome. Uh, and I, I, I said, uh, I, I want to, I, I, as I typically start off these things, I thought I might ask you to, if you could, uh, I know it was just a couple of years ago, but if you might be able to put yourself back to when you were in college and maybe give us a little bit of the path you took from undergrad as you went through the decision to go to medical school, to study public health, um, and to, to, to come into your career in the, in the vaccine space. And so, so maybe if you could take us back, again, I know it was just a couple of years ago to when you were, uh, when you were an undergrad and, and what you were thinking as you, as you sort of mapped out your, your next steps. Yeah, rewind it to all the pictures are black and white. Well, John, <laughs> thanks for having me. I mean, I, you know, I've mentioned this before, but I love, I love these because you see the diversity of, of what Georgetown offers and the programs that people come from. So it's, it's fun to hear about that. And I wonder if you guys, if you guys there take class, other classes together, you just happen to converge on something like this, given the, the, the place that you come from. So winding back that clock, I was an undergraduate at University of North Carolina. And in those days you had to, I think maybe you had to declare when you were coming in what you thought you were gonna be. And I'm sure that 95% of people changed that, but I somehow declared that I was gonna be a zoology major. I have no, I don't really know I can't remember what the thinking was about that, but I'm, then I remember going. So UNC is a giant place, 4,000 per, per cohort for you know, 4,000 freshmen. And you go to these giant classes with two, 300 people. And I remember going to the Zoology 101. We're in the back row. And also to give you a point in time, it's North Carolina. And then there were smoking sections in classrooms. So that just tells you about you know, a different era. Um, and I, all I remember was seeing this woman at the head of the class who was wearing a white lab coat, scribbling something on, with chalk on the board, you know, about something. And somebody said that she was really famous because she had a cockroach named after her. And I'm thinking, I'm not sure this is the path for me. So that's, that was the beginning of it. And then trying to look around to see what, what I might do. I was having a hard time trying to land on something else. And a friend of mine who I'd gone to high school with was at Stanford and they had just started a program called Human Biology. Have you heard of that one? Or maybe, maybe Georgetown has something similar. We do actually. And it was really, it was, a, it was designed as a cross-disciplinary, um, I'll, I'll summarize it sort of thinking about human adaptation in a blend of the social and physical sciences and the life sciences and they had structured that into a program. So, um, I thought about maybe going to Stanford to see if I could try that. That didn't work out for a number of reasons, but I took the course catalog, which was a book, and tried to then mimic this, the, the program at Stanford and UNC had an interdisciplinary studies major. So I could, I could essentially use that as a template and create you know, a major. Uh, and I found that incredibly helpful because you could pick, pick and choose the things you wanted. You weren't stuck taking requirements in some major you weren't interested in and could structure it that way. And probably the most interesting part and probably the part where I learned the most from it was I ended up with advisors in different divisions, one from biology, one from anthropology, one from psychology, and one from the School of Public Health. These four people didn't know each other, but once a month we get to the other for lunch. I couldn't get a word in edgewise because you start to see how much, how much crosstalk they could have sharing their perspective with others. And that's probably the, sort of that, that's the lasting imprint. So the, 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 then, then with the rest of the path, which I'll be brief, the guy who from the School of Public Health was a psychosocial epidemiologist looking at trends in mental health epidemiology. And 
at one point he says, you know, if you if you really want, if you really like this, any of these aspects, you want to drill into it, you should get a PhD. If you're not sure and you think you might want to have a career in medicine, go that way because you'll have much more flexibility later on. So that was the, the guidance that got me started. And then I had an opportunity. So I went to medical school. Um, I had a, 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 my entree to global health was both from medical school. I was in, in, in medical school in New York and the infectious disease rotations would, you know, because it's New York, people come from all over the place with some problem that they picked up somewhere else. So that's your why your approach to global health. You get to see problems coming to you. Um, and and so really start, so starting to see what that was like, you know, through the through the travels people would tell you about what it was like there. And we had a program, a course in parasitology where Corn it was Cornell, and they brought in professors from all over the world who taught their thing. So again, another immersion in global health without traveling. I then had an opportunity to go to I spent a year in the Philippines. The, maybe you've heard of the, the Henry Luce program as a Luce fellow in the Philippines. And that's what really got me, you know, immersed in, in, in the path that I, that I took subsequently. I finished, I finished medical school. I did a residency in internal medicine and then went and spent three years at the Center for Disease Control, two in Atlanta. And then they, they want you to diversify. So if you spend some time in Atlanta, they say go off to a state. And I spent a year in Alaska looking at primarily infectious diseases in the native population. I also happened to be there when the Exxon Valdez ran aground. And because I was with the public health service, became an investigator of that as part of, as part of thing. I came back and did an infectious disease fellowship and an MPH in New York. And then an opportunity to go to the Rockefeller Foundation for a year where they were launching a program called the Children's Vaccine Initiative. And the, the construct of it was couldn't technology solve some of the delivery problems? If we didn't require fancy freezers or a cold chain or, or incredible logistics, couldn't we be, do this better? So that was the original idea, that, which then grew into other programs. Um, I did that for a couple of years, worked at the National Institutes of Health on vaccine technologies, vaccine clinical trials, and then, spent a, then, then moved to Nashville at Vanderbilt, where I, where I started focusing on, on what's now called vaccine hesitancy. The, the, I, the inspiration for that was my son was just born. He's now, he's, we, he graduated from, from college last year. But early on, the, the discussions that, that my wife was having in these moms club where um, vaccines were almost seen as toxic. So that, so that was the original. So here I am at NIH hearing about, or before that, hearing, hearing about the promise of technology and promise of vaccines where mothers were thinking, do we really have to do this? Why do we have these vaccines? And that was really the beginnings of it. So I sort of began to start exploring what that was about when, when even then we did the equivalent of a, gal of a national survey that a quarter of parents were wary of vaccines. And this is long before what took off subsequently. I was there for five years and then, then, then bring it back to where John and I met. I, I I, I came to the net to uh, the Department of Health and Human Services, where they had reconstituted what's called the National Vaccine Program Office, which is a, supposed to be um, co a coordinating office for all the federal assets in vaccines and vaccinations. And I and and I often joke that people like coordination; they don't like to be coordinated. But that's sort of the role is trying to figure how the government can be, you know, stitch itself together to have the most impact, whether it's the research that NIH does, the regulatory aspects of, of the FDA, the program at, at CDC, and including the Defense Department and their role in this as well. So I had there, and then for 15 years, had this incredible perch of looking at the system, both in terms of what the US does and how in the context of, 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 of global health. So I guess the bottom line is this is not linear. I, had it, I was lucky that I sort of had the opportunities I had at the time then at, at, when, when at, at these various inflection points, things came up that were an opportunity. There were other roads that didn't go, so who knows where those would have ended up. And maybe the most important thing was, I'll call them accidental mentors, where you get involved with something, you're now teamed up with somebody, and that person now becomes a mentor. They didn't, it wasn't intended to be that way, but the people you're around that helped to influence you, they may not be overly directive in your career, but they're always there to give you as, as a sounding board. So I think that's the, maybe the takeaways was, it's, it, would, it would be impossible for me to be where you are now and say where that was gonna go. But along the way, sort of keeping your eyes open, seeing what the opportunities were, 
and the importance of, of mentors to give you some, some advice on directions to take or directions not to take. Bruce, that's terrific. And I, I would just say to the class, I, uh, I've done this, this is now the third year or fourth year I've done this. And um, the theme that you ended on is a common theme we hear uh, from, and I hope that all of you take this to heart is, you know, most of us have ended up in where we are through through paths that we wouldn't have we wouldn't have mapped out from where we were. It's it's partly being open and, and being being flexible. Well, let, let's start where you ended. Actually, through. just the one comment is Please. so it's impossible to tell your parents what you're up to because they think, well, <laughs> how come you're not a doctor or how come you didn't do this? So that's that's the that's the that's the landmine there is to be able to explain this, particularly when you're in the middle of a path. So sorry, John, go ahead. No, no, you're right. I I I I. I, I know personally, I, 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 my parents, well, after I got out of law school, they had never had a clue what I did for a living. I just, they just were hopeful, well, thankful that their grandchildren had a house and that to, to live in. But, but let, let's go to, the, I, th I do think the National Vaccine Program Office is a terrific place. I mean, we are in a national debate right now about how well we are distributing vaccines. You know, on one level, it, it's a, it's a historic scientific achievement, right? We've, Vaccines have never been developed in such a short period of time, but there is a, a sense that we're not as organized as we could be to get back the, the new vaccines in arms. And so I guess given where you sat, Bruce, for so many years, if you could give us your take on how are we doing, um, both on the development side but all, uh, of the new vaccines, but also how are we doing in terms of, of um, of, of delivery of vaccines, distribution, and what if if we could do better, what would what would you recommend? So so, and I don't know which articles you've had a chance to look at, but what I say when I, when I was at HHS, I must have said honestly twice a week. Now I only say it once a month. Is that there's there's a vaccine world and a vaccination world, and they're not really connected. They sort of are, but they're totally different orbits. They're different kinds of people. It requires totally different kinds of of expertise uh, and a perspective. And so frankly, because I was looking at the system from the National Vaccine Program Office, got a chance to see that. And people often confuse, even the word vaccine. A company, a company might say, well, we have vaccine, we'll be done with vaccine, we'll, we'll have produced vaccine by X date. That date is probably three weeks different from when there's a vaccine that can be in a CVS pharmacy to give to somebody. So people even have a different concept of what they're talking about, which is part of the confusion. So, but John, to your point, I, I think a, a couple of things. Just think where we are almost exactly a year ago when this looked like it was gonna become the problem it became, what was the word about vaccines? At best, we're 18 months away. Nobody would say less than that. And even that um, was seen as optimistic. When you look at the development type, vaccine development timelines, they're much longer. The, the historic one prior was four years. And that was sort of an easy, in retrospect, it was an easy one because they sort of knew how to put it together. That was for months. <clears throat> but some of these take much longer and some of them take forever. I mean, I how long have we been working on an AIDS vaccine? So, so the length of the of time for development is really long. We can talk some more about that. And so a year ago, people were, were trying to be optimistic, but not laughable and saying, oh, 18 months or two years. So imagine where we'd be now if we were still six months away from even knowing if we had anything that was going to work. So that part of it is truly historic. The fact, and, and there, there are aspects of that um, that are that I think we're going to have to replicate in peacetime to see how we can how we can do that so that vaccines don't take forever to, to develop. But they but putting them together in less than a year and having them perform as well as they can, nobody would have expected that. So that truly is incredible. Um, and so on that side, they get a, the, the, the warp speed people, and that was probably the worst name of, a, of, a, of a, <laughs> when there are people who are wary and wary about political pressure, make, driving things fast, um, and truth and transparency. That was why that name was particularly problematic. But nevertheless, these vaccines came forward. The one thing that was also a surprise, frankly, is how good all the news was. We only recently, we, we heard about some of these vaccines from major companies like Merck, who, went, who, who took a go at it and didn't work out. That's more the, the case, that the majority of vaccines at the beginning of the pipeline don't make it all the way through because of one, either you can't make them or you, it's, it's way too expensive. 
or they have side effects, or they don't have the immune response, or they interfere with other part of immune system. There are whole things that go wrong. And part of the early stage is to figure out which things might work. The NIH often talks about their role is de-risking things. They'll look at the stuff that's way upstream, and if it fails, fine, move on, do something else, um, but keep trying things. So the idea that there were so it was so little bad news was surprising. And, and frankly, I, I worried a little bit about that the bad news was being masked, and I, I don't think that was the case. But you would expect more disappointments, and particularly how, how people were hanging on the promise of a vaccine to get us out of this mess. Bad news were going to be a, you know, there were going to be a, a big problem, not only for the pandemic, but for morale and how long we think we'd be stuck in it. So that all worked out quite well. There's some pieces that were left undone that we can talk about a little bit that should have been done, and now they're going to have to be done now. For example, I'm sure you've all heard about these two dose vaccines where it's important based on the clinical studies to get the same vaccine for the second dose as you did to the first dose, because that's what was tested. We have no idea if you got Pfizer first and Moderna second, if that's okay. It might be, you can think of the theoretical reasons why it would be, but there's no data. And that'll get ever more confusing as more of these vaccines find their way in that are different types. So this Johnson & Johnson vaccine is gonna come to the FDA next week. That'll be available soon. And what happens if you got a first dose with, with a Moderna vaccine and by the time you find a, a, your way to an appointment, you go somewhere else and all they're offering you is Johnson Johnson. What do you do about that? There's no data. And frankly, I'm surprised that that wasn't part of the, the program to try to have some understanding of how these products, should they be available, how they would be, whether or not they're interchangeable. So that's the sort of vaccine side. And it's, and, and everybody was surprised at how well these vaccines performed with the initial ones. The, these vaccines had an efficacy of 90, 95%. The only thing that's better than that is the measles vaccine. Childhood vaccines in general are, are probably the best products that medicine offers. In, in adults, they don't work so well because immune systems are not quite as, as tuned up. And so adults traditionally have the vaccines for adults have less effectiveness. Nevertheless, these were remarkable. And the fact that out of nowhere, a new technology shows up and voila, it's got this kind of, kind of effectiveness was a big surprise. That's, a, that's, that's in some ways might be an impediment for all the other stuff to follow because it's hard to match up to that. And I think we're gonna see that as well. If people think, well, I'll tell you a story of my aunt last week who said, well, I'm a little disappointed because I finally got a, a, a reservation for a vaccine, but it's not until March. And my friend got one next week, which means she'll get either Pfizer or Moderna and I'll get stuck with Johnson & Johnson. So the idea that this is now seen as a second class vaccine or not as good as others, and particularly we think about a vaccine like that that's a single dose, that you might wanna think about distributing that preferentially to, to, the, to parts of the country in parts of the world where a second dose is incredibly complicated. So if you can achieve that, the, the immunity you need with one dose, greatly simplifies the program, but that might also come with a perception by thinking, how come we're getting the crummy stuff? So that's a, that's a conversation that's yet to be had, but when that comes forward and people, there's more of a discussion about that, I think we're gonna hear that, that theme. We're gonna have to figure out how to manage that when all these vaccines perform incredibly well, yet there'll be this perception there's a difference. On the vaccination side, and that's where the, the vaccine world and the vaccination world, you know, it, it was pretty clear that that wasn't as, that there wasn't as much, and you, you've seen this in real time, that that it wasn't thought as thought through as well. There are there are systems primarily in the United States for children um, about about the what's called the Vaccine for Children program that that the CDC works with the states, and that's that's a program that was started in the early 90s with the recognition that, that vaccines for many of the population were not accessible because they weren't affordable and some other reasons. So that program came into place, this is the Vaccine for Children program for routine immunizations to ensure that, that, that there was access to vaccine. That worked out incredibly well. And I had the chance, I mean, so we'll go back to HHS, every, every health secretary who I had a chance to talk to, I would say this is the best model of a program for health equity of anything. Show me something that beats this, where you've got a program where you have, you, you intentionally, you buy the products, you distribute the products, you monitor them. There's an accountability program and with an intention to make sure that people are not denied access, a hugely expensive program, but a huge impact. 
And that's the basis, frankly, of this federal state relationship of, well, the federal government does so much, particularly CDC, and then the program is largely up to the states. I think that's the flaw in the planning here is that this is not just a big vaccine for children program, in large part because children aren't the main target. That, that children's program is well lubricated, that people know who they are, that there's a distribution system, there's a, there's, a, there's a management system for it. And that essentially has been adapted for this, which works to some degree, but not to the scale it is. And then frankly, we don't have in the United States a tradition of mass vaccination programs. In other parts of the world, maybe some of you had a chance to see that, um, where they'll, they'll vaccinate millions of people in a weekend. They got tens of thousands of people doing it. They know how to do it. They've done it for polio. They've done it for other, for other things. And in fact, there's a movement away from these mass programs because they're so labor intensive and the global side to try to have more routine immunization rather than these mass programs because the mass programs can be pretty wasteful. You just vaccinate everybody you can. And a lot of times, particularly with polio, people are getting many, many more doses than they actually need, but they're there when the vaccinators come through. So I think that that was the, the essentially the flaw of anticipating the scale of what needed to happen and the logistics of doing it. The fact that only now are you, are they figured out a system that doesn't work to make reservations, you could have predicted this. And while the numbers, the, the, the numbers of the, the scale of, vac of vaccine available was gonna initially be much lower than available, that was going to, that was why you needed to, to have some program, some system like that, that could accommodate people as opposed to this endless, what people are doing is teaming up with their neighbors to try to stay up all night and go to some websites and all the stories you've heard about. That, that should have been anticipated and worked on long before now. Uh, unclear why it wasn't. I'm also a little bit surprised that there wasn't some effort to take advantage, if you will, of flu. So, all this stuff is gearing up over the fall and with vaccine that might be available late in the year. And now we have influenza where this year there were 200 million doses of flu vaccine, give or take, that were available <coughs> to the U.S. market. It's a lot of vaccine to distribute essentially between August and, and Thanksgiving. That could have been a simulation. So why that wasn't an exercise of trying to test out the system, I don't know. It wouldn't have been easy to do because it's for a lot of reasons as far as who buys it and how it's distributed and the like. But that was a chance in the fall to test out the system that we're now testing out in real time. And so so is it your take at this point, Bruce, that there's no magic bullet? Whatever planning we could have, should have, those are all of the sort of could have, should have categories. Right now, distribution really is gonna be just about trying to work through these issues in real time, trying to get websites better, more functional, I mean, get get the get more vaccine, obviously, but that <coughs> there's not a lot, there's no magic solution at this point. It's it's just gonna be lots of little pieces. I think that's right. I mean that I think that the efforts to try to figure out what works and what doesn't. So the states, I mean, they now are grappling with this, they're seeing what the what the what the issues are. I think comparing notes in real time is is an important. And I was on a call last week where that was happening. And for instance, somebody from was North Carolina was talking about the balance that they have is, is in terms of speed versus equity. You can figure out how to get a lot of vaccine absorbed in a short period of time, but unless you keep the equity lens on, it's not going to go to the people who the whole conversation about equity, equity was about. So one, I mean, this is not rocket science, but one solution that they were doing in North Carolina was giving various community groups, whether it's a church or some community groups that, okay, you got 100 doses, go find people in your community and make reservations for them. So that at least gets you that down to, again, not rocket science, but a way to try to keep equity and distribution and speed uh, going at the same time. I think we're gonna, they'll start to sort this out. Um, you know, I'm always amazed how, how poorly interactive in, in IT systems are. That might or might not get fixed. We were told that there was some fancy IT system whether it's working or not, whether it actually met its promise or not is a separate issue. CVS and Walgreens, they each have their own systems. They don't talk to each other. And anecdotally, people said that, they, that if they got a dose at some CVS, you pretty much have to go to the same one. You can't go to another one, even though they should have the same system. So that's something that should have been figured out ahead of time and wasn't. This whole reservation thing is crazy. 
Um, and I think that with learnings plus increased supply, it'll be less frustrating, but it's driving everybody crazy. And everybody has a story about trying to help their neighbor or their grandmother navigate this. So, right. um, so that, yeah. that'll get better again, both in terms of um, experience and supply. And how about the hesitancy side? You you referenced that in you know even the case of your your son years ago, but um, I, I'm still I, I struggle sometimes to understand how I, there are clearly surveys polling has shown that some communities, particularly some of the communities that we're most interested in from an equity lens, uh, there's understandable and of course historic reasons why uh, African American communities or Native communities, American Indian communities might. Would, would people would be uh, anxious about vaccines. Do, do you have a sense, one, of how much that may be driving some of the distribution issues, or are we, or, or is there progress being made there? It sounds like the North Carolina example is a great one, but do you have a sense more broadly about how much hesitancy is out there and if there's any potential it's, that's break? A, it's, a, it's a great question. So there's not a good metric. And, and I think that's something that's lacking with this whole sphere of vaccine hesitancy. Because you want to know, it's you know we we often joked about this a long time ago, of, and I'm not an economist, but the consumer confidence index somehow put together based on I don't know what, the, the price of hamburger plus rent plus a quarter cost to go to a movie plus I don't know what else, and they have this index that tells somebody to turn the knobs in the economy right to try to readjust them. We don't have anything like that. We've got questions that we ask. There's not an equivalent index that's worked out anywhere. So we don't really know where we are. And then the problem is you end up doing two things, I think. One of them is you, you substitute volume for um, the, 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 the volume of the noise for the degree of the problem. And that's, that, that's you can't, what do you do with that? Because if, there are, if it's loud, doesn't mean there's a lot of it. And it may be just a few people who are loud. So I think there's that part of it. And then there are surveys. And I think the surveys, that's sort of the indicator, the index, if you will, but I think the surveys, they're better now than they were, but I think they were seriously flawed, the surveys in the summer, which said, uh, when there's a COVID vaccine, will you take it? Who would say yes to something which is, nobody knows anything about it? I mean, it's, this, this jewel is still in the box and you're trying to buy it. So I think that that to me was, I mean, who, and who would say yes to that? And I think that the way you structure those questions is, is fed into that. So then you had this now, um, narrative that there were all these people who didn't want a vaccine because they weren't going to take it the minute it was available. And then there's the people who are the first ado early adopters. You know, not, you know, when, when there's an iPhone, there's a long line of people. When there's a new vaccine, a lot of people say, well, let's wait and see. Um, and there's a famous story about a guy named Maurice Hilleman. Well, Hilleman died several years ago. He was the chief scientist for Merck. He's responsible for, for most of their vaccines. And he used to say that he never slept well at night until 3 million people have been vaccinated. Some ballpark number of, you want to have some sense, is there something looming that you didn't see in the clinical study of even tens of thousands of people that would show up at a level of one in 10,000, one in 100,000, one in a million. And it's only when you have that much experience that you feel some confidence that you're in pretty good shape, that what you have is going gonna, is gonna to benefit people and there's not some looming problem because there have been experiences like that where there were these problems that surfaced. So I think that was part of it. So a lot of people would say, I'll wait and see. And then people have a different appetite for what they're waiting to see. And I think that's, that's fed into it as well. But the larger issue, frankly, is trust. Um, people don't know, they, don't ha they, don't ha they haven't seen how vaccines are developed. Why should they trust the system? Particularly if the tr system they haven't trusted other parts of the system for legitimate reasons. And I think that's the heart of this. Why? So the question they would say is, oh, how come now they're being nice to me? And, and how, do you, how do you then answer that question about what can, you, what can you tell someone about any of this that would give them some trust? Frankly, I think that that was unfortunate that despite the, the incredible, as I said, historic vaccine development, the, I, that was almost ruined by the political pressure that seemed to be put on, on, the, on the system, particularly the FDA. And I give the former FDA commissioner a lot of credit for pushing back and frankly, preserving the, uh, the, the brand of the FDA. Because if it was felt that the FDA could get pushed around and somebody they would make an approval because of the calendar, 
why would you trust anything you ate or any drug that you took? So I think that there was a lot more at stake than this. Um, I don't think he slowed things down. He, they kept things at a, at a pace that was faster than normal. But I think that that movement by the commissioner, along with the, the, the professionals, the FDA, was really important in trying to at least maintain trust and push it past the perception of political pressure. But it gets back to, you know, why should I believe this? Why should I believe the, the, the science is what it is, particularly when there are plenty of people who want to tell you it's different? Um, and then why should I trust the people at CDC who make the recommendations when they do when they've seen other things that the CDC has done because they've kowtowed to other pressure? So I think it, it, it gets back to that. And, and there's lots of, unfortunately, there are too many experiences where the people on the margins have, have lots of good reasons, either personally, in their community, historically, to not trust the, the authorities. Well, I'm going to put a Jusha and the students on notice. This will be my last question, then I'll turn it over to you guys. But I want to maybe take us up, because uh, I think all the issues we talked about, um, manufacturing, distribution, hesitancy, obviously play out throughout the world. Uh, you know, I, I like to say uh, all all health is global. Um, and But I guess I'd ask you, before we jump into the next set of questions, is if you could help us handicap where you think the international community is. Um, we've, we've got, a, you know, the manufacturers have, have clearly produced, made this historic, you know, this historic scientific achievement, but the supply on a global level is far, far below the need. Um, Western countries, including the United States, have contracts for huge portions of the, the supply that's out there. So it raises one a set of questions around equity, both from a moral standpoint, but also from a public health standpoint. One thing we learned in this this last year is that you can't you can't keep infectious diseases uh, outside your borders. So so we in the long run the world needs uh, everyone to be vaccinated, or at least a very large portion of the world to be vaccinated. Um, so I guess a, your sense of how the international community is doing on the vaccine side, uh, how, how do you think of it from an equity and uh, sort of public health lens? And, uh, and what, do, what do you think needs to be done next? I'm sorry, that's a big question, but I think- oh, any... <laughs> No, I know, I said, those are, those are obvious, I'm, I'm laughing because those, yeah. are, those are massive and we'll talk some more about those. Yeah. You know, I think that part of this is, and John, you and I go back to when yeah. we last time. So 10, 10 years ago, the H1N1 influenza pandemic, when there was an effort to try to make sure that there was some, that the, that the rest of the world had access to some vaccines, when it was the same issue, that there are relatively few manufacturers of influenza vaccine, and they were supplying the globe, and the people with either the money or the wherewithal to have contracts basically locked up all the supply. Uh, and I think that lesson, I mean, there, was, there were efforts to try to alleviate that a little bit. They were too, frankly, the bottom line was too little and too late. Just mm -hmm. to make sense, you've seen these massive numbers of how many doses are being are pro being promised to be produced. COVAX, which is, maybe you've read about that, which is put together on the global, the global side to try to be a, basically a, a purchaser for the, the many who can't, they either don't have the, the funds or don't have the wherewithal to have contracts are working for many of those countries. And their goal is to have 2 billion doses this year when the global need is 16 billion, right? So if you're gonna, if, if this is a, again, the math, the math, you can round out the numbers, but if everybody is susceptible and you wanna have everybody immune, then everybody needs two doses and whatever number you're gonna pick for the number of people on the globe times two. So that's where they are. So even that effort is, and their goal is to have enough vaccine available for 20% of any country's populations. That's not what the goal is of the Western countries. So I think that even, even there is, you can have some questions about equity. And, and there are many countries, and I've heard this recently about Africa, that said, you know, 20% is nice, but we need 60% coverage. And we have to figure out some way to then get that from these limited manufacturers. It gets back to an important point about manufacturing. This is not like um, turning all the, all the ovens in the world into a bakery. There's, so, so I think it's really important that there are only a few places that can make this. And in fact, only we're seeing now how a company that makes vaccines that's not in the COVID race 
and say, we have these facilities, we can make your vaccine in ours. So they think that's gonna help because it takes specialized facilities and they're not necessarily interchangeable. So there are parts of it that are, but I think that that's where it's, it's limited to the people who can make it. And the last thing you want is to have people who've never done this before get in the vaccine business because they'll screw it up. And so that's, so you wanna have people with a, who know how to do it, who know how to deal with what all the complexities of vaccine manufacturing and in, uh, I'll, we can get into it, but it's very different than drug manufacturing, which is a chemical process. Vaccines are a biological process, which means things have to grow and then things have to, you, you, can't, you, you can't use a mass spec to figure out what's in a vaccine. You can, but you can't predict how well it's gonna perform. It's only about how well it works in people, which is why they do all these clinical trials and you have to keep doing testing in people to make sure that when you go from a small scale to a large scale, the product's the same. Short story, the short, the short answer there is there's only limited places you can do that and therefore the supply is gonna be limited. That's the nature of it. There were huge investments we hear about man, all this manufacturing that was supposed to be scaled up before vaccines were ready. It's not clear how much that, how much, maybe that's still a work in progress, but when you have a pandemic and you've got a global need, the supplies are gonna be limited. So you're stuck with this distribution problem to try to have some equity and then each country has to have a prioritization scheme of who gets to go first and who gets to go last. So I think that's, so, so the, the, the answer, John, to your question is much better than it was 10 years ago, because there's an organization that's put in place that is doing that contracting for those who can't and trying to get vaccine in the same time frame that the wealthy world is getting it, not waiting until everybody else has had theirs. And then all the, all the available ca capacity that's no longer needed is now steered elsewhere. Excellent. Well, that's a perfect setup. And so, why don't I uh, ask Shushuan to start us off, and then we'll uh, then I'll go to Liddy and Jacqueline. How does that sound? So, want to kick us off? Yeah. Um, thank you for talking to us. Um, and I have a question, like going off like the international like distribution of vaccines. Um, I know like Sabin um, has this program called COVID nineteen vaccine equity project. And um, I think it's like collaborating with um, a system called Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator, which is, I'm assuming it's a part of the WHO or the United Nations system. So um, I'm just wondering if you could touch, like talk about this program a little bit in detail. Sure, sure, thanks. So um, it's just getting started and we'll see how successful it is. But the purpose of this one, unlike what I just talked about, which I'll call global equity, is there at a global level, um, is there enough to go around? Each country has to then answer that for themselves. And when it gets to the country, how is a country factoring in equity, factoring in equity? <laughs> so I think that's that. So that's the principle there, because this is an experience that hasn't that really many countries haven't gone through before of if when you get a limited amount, how do you figure out who should get it within your population? You may have seen that, that in the United States, we, there was a, a, a couple of exercises recently. We did one years ago with influenza, but there was a, a, a large discussion report from the National Academy of Medicine, which looked at that and, just, and came up with a framework for which equity was an important consideration. And that, and that framework had to also consider, you know, you have limited supplies, who gets to go first and on what basis and what the goals are, the degree which you're trying to reduce morbidity and mortality, the degree to which you might be trying to dampen the pandemic by reducing transmission, or the degree to which you have other concerns like national security and the functioning of society. So therefore, depending on where you, which of those goals you're prioritizing, you might, you might aim vaccine to people who are infirm, who are gonna be the most likely to have bad outcomes, to people who keep our society going, like, gro like grocery stores and bus drivers and school teachers, to the national security aspects, and how do you balance all those things when you've got limited supply and how you do it? And frankly, the part that never has been done by anybody, and we're watching it in real time now, is how do you actually pull that off? You can come up, come up with this fancy scheme of these people get to go first and these people go next, but now look what happens. You got people driving hundreds of miles to go get in a line somewhere. People are now getting a job at a grocery store so they can say, oh, I'm a grocery worker. So people are gaming the system. So that's one that, that we're gonna learn a lot from that. But on this project that we're doing with, with, the, with, with the ACT Accelerator and the World Health Organization is trying to take those kind of learnings into the country and help them think through of how they're going to do this. And probably the most important point of this 
is, and they need it's it's it falls under technical assistance in a lot of different ways. But I'd say the big picture here is how did how did how is a country going to get all the voices around the table to actually have this conversation? The equivalent of what I just talked about is the different sectors who can make their case of why they deserve to go to go first or why they deserve to have access to vaccine when access is limited. So we're taking we're trying this now. It's 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 another one of these that as you'll learn when you're in this uh, nonprofit world, it depends on your resources to do these things. And we need to have enough to continue to do that. We've, we've done a lot of pilot countries to see where the lessons are, and now are trying to scale it more broadly as vaccine is just now beginning to be shipped. Excellent. So Libby, do you wanna? Yeah, of course. Um, so you already briefly mentioned the development of older va vaccines. So building off of that from a more historical perspective, I was wondering if you could speak to any major takeaways from previous pandemics or previous mass vaccina vaccination campaigns, um, and if there are any takeaways that we could use to improve the current COVID vaccination effort. That's, that's a great question. Um, you know, when you go, so, so the only human disease to be eradicated is smallpox. Their polio is almost there, but not quite there. There's a veterinary disease called rinderpest that's also been eradicated, but that's it. So they can go back and, and look at some of these. So while we go back and, and are proud of the efforts to eradicate smallpox, when you talk to the people who did it, it wasn't easy. There was a similar issue of, of you know, people who come into your community and they're doing this vaccine program the vaccines were a lot more, they had a lot more side effects than the current vaccines do. Um, so you can imagine the stories that come along with that and people hiding their children and the like. So I think there's a lot of lessons there. I will say that that um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the developing world, the current experiences with polio and, and UNICEF has done a lot of work in trying to better understand the, com, you know, the community, um, the, you know, the, what the issues are in the community. But I will also say that that from a um, from another perspective, if there there is all the focus on eradication um, is a little bit distorting. So people in a country will say, "How can we doing all this stuff for polio when we got these thousand other problems you're not paying attention to?" So I think that that's where again there's a little bit of a distortion of that, and then people might be suspect of that as well. But I think that that's one one of the lessons. I think clearly there's something that the United States is gonna benefit from is how do these countries do these mass vaccination programs? There's a lot of experience with that, with getting the community health workers and others to, to perform their part in it. Um, you can't just start them up scratch and say, go at it. So I think there's some, some lessons there. I mentioned the one before about 10 years ago about the vaccine distribution and that clearly, that, that e episode is clearly built into what COVAX is trying to do. I think COVAX is now a permanent structure in terms of, 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 of broader global equity. Gavi, who some of you may have heard about, was put in place 20 years ago to try to shorten the timeline between when vaccines were available in the, in the wealthy world and could be available else, just regular vaccines. So, because otherwise it would take 20 years for a new vaccine that was available in the United States to work its way into Africa. So Gavi, the, again, the organization, the funding, the mass purchasing has made a huge difference in sort of shortening that timeline and making vaccines more available. So I think COVAX is the beginning of a new structure that's going to make sure, and they'll learn from this one as well on how to do this, um, and even have it more, have available have vaccine available more rapidly um, um, than than even currently. But I will say that they are quite conscious of the fact that they give this in days. I think today or tomorrow. So yesterday there was a there was a WHO meeting and they said it's been 64 days, six they had a number since the first country, which I guess was the UK, began distributing the first COVID vaccine, and that that timing is very important to them because they want to be able to make sure that they are keeping up. And so there was even an announcement uh, at the end of last week about some early doses that are going to be distributed through that network. Very few. But they're very conscious about making sure that the that the rest of the world isn't waiting for leftovers. Absolutely, I know they're really focused on getting some vaccines out this month. For example, just as a not only obviously 
practical benefit, but symbolic benefit that we're closing, shortening that time horizon. Right. No, absolutely. Uh, Jacqueline? Uh, sure. Um, well, thank you for uh, speaking with us today. Um, and in your review of Heidi Larson's book, um, Stuff, you described how easily misinformation regarding um, COVID and vaccines have uh, has spread. Um, so what would you say that the a government can do to combat the infodemic um, surrounding COVID and the pandemic simultaneously? No, it's a huge, it's a huge problem. I mean, it's not just, I mean, I, and the platforms are rightly so under a lot of pressure, right? Because they're, you know, they are conveying all kinds of information, good and bad. Um, I, I think it's pretty tricky as far as how to manage that. And I think Heidi makes a good point of saying, you know, you, this, while we, you feel like you're playing whack-a-mole, that's not gonna be the answer because her point is it's more about the, the trust and the relationships than it is about the misinformation. Um, so I think that, that and, and it's not only that good information is gonna be the, be the answer. Um, and I think that you probably all experienced that just having the right answer to somebody with, who doesn't, who, who has a different belief system, you're not gonna convince anybody of anything. So I think that to me, from a clinical basis, and I think it's the same at a community level is, trying to figure out what's the core problem? What is it about the, this issue that people don't like? Is it truly a safety issue? A lot of times safety is put out there, not that it's to be, safety is an important consideration, but a lot of times safety is out there as the, well, how, we can, how can we be sure it's really safe tomorrow or safe over the next 50 years or whatever it is? So that's a little, but there may be something more to it. It could be these issues we talked about before about trust. Why should I believe them now? What can you show me? And I think the question is really is what information from what source might help people understand this and how can we help people make better decisions? So I think that, that it's within there somehow of, of, of it's not just information, but it's how that information is conveyed. Uh, I've been impressed by the, 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 the people who do, what's, I guess it's called social network analysis of how information spreads and how therefore behaviors might spread. There's a, a, a guy I've gotten to know named Damon Santola, who's at Penn, and, and he's got this great little video that he put together, an experiment he did, and it was about climate change. He has climate change data, and it's pretty clear what the implications are. And then he puts, he has people, he put on, on the same, I guess, however, however he did this study on the internet, he put in the corner a donkey or an elephant. Didn't say anything about it, but just had that in the corner. And then asked people what the interpretation was. The same data, people framed it very differently. And depending on how they perceived that, they concluded totally opposite. So, so the, same, the facts were the same, but the perceptions were, were, were totally opposite because they thought, well, here's the source of it. Here's where it's coming from or the like. So I think we need to understand that, understand the biases that people might have, and then to try to figure out from that how we can help them um, to make the right decisions. It's not simple, but it's not merely shutting down the anti-vaccine fringe. That's, there's a whole, that's a whole other strand, and they are clearly intentionally, um, you know, and you can see this in a lot of ways, it, there's clearly an intentional strategy for a variety of different reasons uh, that, that, that people may have about dissuading people taking vaccines. Um, we're going to have to try to understand that and why people are vulnerable to that kind of information and how we can help them. And then the people in the middle who are just trying to figure it out and do the right thing. And again, it gets back to what's the, what, what are they really looking for? What's the real question? And who's the best person or the best source to answer that? Wow, that's a great question and answer. Thank you. So I'm, I want to open it up now to the rest of our uh, students enrolled in the class. If there are other questions, maybe just raise your hand. Um, I think we, uh, we're a single screen, so I think I can identify folks. If anybody? Any? Oh, here we go. Okay, good. How about uh, let's start. I've got I've got several questions now. So let's start with Shoa. Uh, why don't you start us off? Yeah, hi, Dr. Gillen. Um, you spoke about vaccine hesitancy, and you know, of course, that that has a comorbidity um, with a lack or a shortcoming of health literacy. Um, so, my question was, um, how does the push for vaccination take shortcomings in health in health literacy into account? 
Um, and how do these shortcomings affect your implementation strategy? That's a, another great question. I, mean, I think obviously there's a whole range of, of understanding of this. I mean, from you know, a molecular level to a, a community level. And I guess it's trying to trying to understand what it is. Again, it gets back to how to try to understand to tr try to help people understand the issue that they're trying to grapple with. I, I think another part of it might be again. This doesn't really answer your question, but some perception of the social norm that if you have a clear sense of what other people are doing or people like you are doing and how they're making decisions, that might help as well because you think, well, there the people like me are doing this is, are making these kind of decisions as well. But clearly, health literacy is a part of it, but it's not the only part because the health literacy implies that it's just a, a technical lack of understanding. And I think that's a piece of it, but it also is trying to understand how what it is that that people might might what, what might might be steering them in the wrong direction. I've been impressed by on the global side, the number of I mean programs that have, have been quite successful in populations where literacy is clearly an issue. And, and mothers will walk miles to an immunization clinic because they understand what the purpose is. So I think that, that, that there, there are ways to convey this without literacy per se, uh, with that common understanding and that may be an, more of an oral history of how, how that may happen. But, but when, you, when you look and see the, the vaccination coverage in many places, um, it's surprising how good it is, even though there may be flaws, even in places where literacy isn't perfect. Sorry, oh, if I may add on to that question, uh, do we have time? I, well, Dr. Gellin's been generous. He's going to stay a little bit longer. So uh, yeah, watch, a quick follow-up, and then I'll keep, try to get the remainder yeah. questions. Yeah, um, actually, I know there are a lot of other folks who had questions, so I'm fine waiting. To go that. ahead, go ahead, quick, 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 quick. OK, um, so uh, we saw Vice President Pence uh, get vaccinated on television. And we have, of course, all of these conflicting sources of information from like the news media to doctors and public health officials, um, to even like celebrities showing themselves getting vaccinated. Um, is there any, are there any problems you foresee there? Or are there any like things you would recommend for getting people more accustomed to this idea of getting vaccinated? Well, let me tell you about another. So um, I think that those are, those efforts I think make sense. Um, because people, but it's not just famous people. I think it's, again, people like me. So I think at a community level to see a, a nurse in a hospital that you go to, I think, frankly, those things I would think make a big difference. You know, if, if Tom Brady gets vaccinated, I guess maybe that's going to help somebody. Uh, Although who knows, you know, he, if it's not avocado, he might not go for it. Uh, but so there's that question, but, but I was involved in a, in a, in a group. It's really interesting. Um, it's a group of people who came together to try to essentially tackle the question you raised is they, they looked at, in, within the United States, the, they, there's something, I mean, you've heard about the social vulnerability index, which is another one of these indices that sort of is the place where you can identify based on a number of different things from um, income to access to food, to access to transportation. These are the places in the country that are, that are gonna be the most trouble um, with access to health. And that gives you a map. So they took a map of these places and then they said, okay, who do we know who might be influential? And, they, and then they, however they came up with these lists of sports figures and music people who might be influential even at a local level. So they found some band who was popular in some corner of Norfolk, Virginia. And they said, okay, how about you guys? And they have their own following. So again, it's a decentralized view, not just the Surgeon General and the President and people like that, but at a local level. So I think that, you know, I don't know how successful it's been, but the idea is, you know, influencers matter and local influencers might even matter than national influencers. So why don't we turn to Valen, Kayla and Kira. We'll try to have everybody try to keep their questions relatively short, um, uh, but Valen, why don't you start us off? Yeah. Um, so. Thank you so much for speaking with us. Um, and in the direct, the WHO Director General's uh, address, um, he said that vaccine equ uh, equity is not just a moral imperative, it's also a strategic and economic one. And I thought this was really interesting because to me, like a moral argument can't really be contested with um, because equity and like 
equal distribution. But if when you bring strategic and economic imperatives into the picture, um, it seems to me that rich countries ha then have the excuse to use that to, you know, violate, you know, a COVAX procedure or, you know, um, do what's best for their country, like that's fair play. So how do you think, how powerful do you think this like moral argument is in reality um, or like in the situation that we face today? No, I, I, when I they're a, up against, you know, these strategic, sorry. That's a great, I mean, it's a great question. I think the moral argument works for some, but it doesn't work for all. And, and I'll call it making the business case, which is I think the other part of it, that unless the world is safe to travel, um, it's a problem for everyone. So while we might have perfect immunity, are you gonna go someplace where the pandemic is continuing? So I think the principle therefore, and the mantra that comes with it is, you know, that, that, that disease anywhere is a disease everywhere. And I think there is that recognition. Now how that plays out is a separate issue, but I think it does, it does lay out that this is a global pandemic. We've seen it, we've seen it, you know, uh, this, we've seen it play out like that and therefore need to understand that unless there is more immunity in the population broadly, the world's a very unsafe place, which then gets into all kinds of other things, which are maybe gets back to the, to the, to the moral imperative of even movement. If, I mean, there, I'm sure you've seen this discussion about immunity passports, the idea that you can only get, go to places, whether it's getting an airplane or going to a movie, unless you can show that you have immunity. Now that's going to be an interesting thing to to try to see how that gets how that gets played out. My guess is we're going to start to see things like that. And again, I, if you can see that there are huge swaths of the world who can't go anywhere or can't do anything because they don't have that immunity, that layers it on top of as well, separate from the economic, societal, and frankly security security issue. So, I think he tried to hit all bases and trying to convince the countries either with the dollars or who had the vaccines to move them to other parts of the world more quickly than they might otherwise. So how about Kayla? This question is perhaps a little bit similar to what Valen just asked, but it was also regarding something that Director General Tedros said in one of his recent speeches, which was, it's right that all governments want to prioritize vaccinating their own health workers and older people first but it's not right that younger, healthier adults in rich countries are vaccinated before health workers and older people in poorer countries. And I was wondering what you thought of that statement from the lens of global, global governance and perhaps if there should be certain policies and procedures in place on the international level that determine vaccine rollout. Like if every country should be following the same tiers at the same time, mm -hmm. or if certain countries who have this capacity of millions, tens of millions of vaccines like the United States and who are in a dire circumstance right now with COVID, should they be able to go ahead and continue vaccinating their population? That's a, that's a great question. I, I think it, it's, and this is maybe a good one, John, to end on because it's yeah. A, yeah. in terms of, you know, what's the authority of the World Health Organization? They're not the global police force, the health police force. And that's a separate issue of, you know, maybe there needs to be something in that about uh, about how to make the world a safer place. So, so cajoling is a big part of it, which is why you see this moral and economic argument. And so while there is a, a committee at, at WHO who, saw, who, who sets overall guidance um, on prioritization um, and vaccination, countries then are, have their own sovereignty and they'll do what they want. And that's the way the system works. Um, then when they do things differently, then they may get called on it and what's their rationale for that? And you'll start to see that. I, you know, so I think that the, I don't think he's gonna be successful in having everybody just vaccinate the healthcare workers and people over 65 and then get around to everybody else. Um, but I think it just makes the case that depending on what your goals are, if your goals are, are on reducing deaths or re reducing mor morbidity and, and, and mor morbidity, then you're going to aim your vaccine in some places than if your goals are to keep society functioning. Um, and then there are health consequences related to that as well. And so I think it gets in there. From there, from WHO standpoint, it's mostly about uh, morbidity and mortality, because that's that's you know what they're most concerned about. Um, but recognizing that it's it's not only that. So I think that that's that's it, it's that philosophy that drives that. 
because they're just trying to keep people from having a, having bad problems. And we're fortunate that people who are younger don't have don't suffer the, don't suffer the consequences that people who who are older and have comorbidities do. But they're still transmitting it. Um, so that's you know there's that side of it as well. So you can let the virus go rampant, um, and you might protect some people, but you're not going to stop the 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 ongoing spread. But it's well, it's, it's a great question for a, a, a global health co class with about global governance. No, that's why I was. I I think we uh, we we've we've taken you over time already, and I just I I mostly want to maybe give you a, if there's any final word you want to leave either on global governance or just thoughts. And I mean, I do think I, I would say this to our class. I mean. You, you are all living through an unprecedented event in world history. Not that there haven't been pandemics or deadly disease outbreaks before, but I don't think ever in history was the whole world aware that, that we were going through this at the same time. This is really a remarkable thing. And what kind of global governance or what kind of even understanding of moral principles do we, do we want to try to build on a, as a global community to answer some of these questions? But Bruce, I don't know if there are any final words other than thank you. No, maybe maybe end with where we started about career paths. And I would say that, I mean, that the <laughs> it's not really the silver lining on this is, but but given that a pandemic affects everybody and it affects all aspects of society, no matter what you're interested in are, where you're from, what you believe, what you're passionate about personally, it's affecting you. And there's some, and so you should think about those things in the context of this. And maybe that's what you write your blog about. Whether you're an artist or want to be a lawyer or want to do international diplomacy, that there's clearly things in this that um, need attention um, and that need to be fixed for the next time and for the times going forward. And so I think it's a chance to think through, this isn't going to be your, your careers. Maybe somebody will be, but but, but remember this as you think about your, what you're interested in and the direction you're going, that there's, that there's something in this, some aspect of it. May, we, didn't, we didn't talk to about 90% of those things from liability to logistics to anything in between that is gonna, that's, that, that your profession of the future will have some way to improve things. How about if I can ask everybody a virtual round of applause for our guest lecturer? That's great, uh, great questions. Thanks, thanks for all that. It was great. And Bruce, thank you so much. We really, uh, we're very yeah. grateful for your time. So we, we, we'll, we'll let you get back to the rest of your life here. And uh, I would also say anyone else who's not uh, enrolled in the class, if you know, it's a good time to, to step out. And then the, those of us who are still in the class, uh, we can we can have a few minutes wrap up here. So, so Great. thank you. All right. Good luck to everybody. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Appreciate it. All right. Well, well. So that was terrific. Why? Well, I, I really uh, great questions, you guys. So, so let me just ask, what what did you all think? Uh, was this was that was a good good session? Anything that Bruce said really stuck with you? Anybody, especially people who didn't have a chance. I'm sorry we couldn't do all the questions, um, uh, but uh, anybody want to jump in? Oh, it looks like Yuna wants to jump in. It, please. Um, yeah, so I thought it was really interesting how he sort of framed it as more than just like an infodemic um, issue when it comes to building trust in communities. Um, and rather that it means like going to these communities and like sort of taking the information and sort of giving it from their perspective, as opposed to just having one source of information for everyone. And I think that that's really important, especially in a time where I feel like we're a lot more divisive when it comes to just any issue in general, um, especially with the pandemic, which has um, just worsened like the motions all around. And so finding that unity and finding ways to sort of give it to everyone from the place that they feel most comfortable um is really beneficial and i thought that was great that he um sort of framed it in that perspective no, i i there's a i couldn't agree more i mean i think if you look at public health more generally uh whether it's strategic communications around behavior change everything from wearing seat belts to not smoking um to healthier diets what what people what's been or or things or even in in infectious disease context like uh, uh, HIV transmission, 
it's it is both a relevant it's a message and a messenger that is tailored to the person who you're trying to get information to it makes sense i mean just think about your own lives how likely are you know if if you're if you're a, a liberal how likely are you going to turn to fox news as your source of information the flip side is if you're a conservative will you want to watch cnn and believe what they have to i mean just think of that that lens um uh and how it plays out so a re really good point you know others anything else he raised anything you said oh, oh uh, kayla this is kind of related to what yumna just said but i thought what he said about the infodemic and relating it back to like what's the deeper issue here that perhaps it's just a distrust in our healthcare system or kind of a feeling in communities that they believe they're not cared for or supported enough by our healthcare system, a sense of distrust between this private sphere and pharmaceuticals and the public or also the government and the public. So maybe it requires more um, fine tune adjustments to our healthcare system rather than just messaging on social media or public health campaigns to convince people that this that the vaccine is safe and effective. What do folks think about that? I, I think that, I think that's a good point. Uh, reactions? Looks like I've got Erica, looks like you've got your hand up. Yeah, um she kind of covered what I want to say. Um okay. but I think it not only um, reflects on the need for transparency um, in the United States um, and reform in our healthcare system, but also in developing countries where um, there are hard to reach areas. I think there's a need to reflect on how the private sector and the public sector can ensure transparency, trust, and um, awareness of vaccinations as a whole. No, I, I, I do think the healthcare system, um, you know, it is, I, I mean, I would just say, you take a country like the United States where we have very uneven access to health care, including lots of people who you know, can't afford it and don't have insurance for it. I, I just, you know, the, and then you put yourself in a situation where from a, a societal standpoint, we really want people to trust the doctors and nurses and people who, you know, in many, for many people's lives, they can't access. Um, I mean, we, I, I, I think the, the pandemic has shown the vulnerability of our um, our lack of unity and our lack of cohesion. Because I think trust and cohesion fit together. Um, uh, and I think you know, it'll be interesting to see when this is done if other countries that have this kind of the level of social polarization like we do um, also struggle with these kinds of questions. So, um, uh, so how about uh, Vella? You you had your hand up too. Yeah, um, kind of uh, just going off of what everyone's saying, I think something that really stuck with me um, that was um, kind of this balance that we're finding between speed, transparency, and equity. So while, you know, like we're aiming for the most speed, uh, like the fastest, you know, track to um vaccination and then we're, we're looking for the most transparent system and the most equitable distribution it almost sounded to me that you know like it compromise comp compromises have to be made and we have to find a balance between the three so i thought that was sort of an interesting um you know perspective in terms of you know what we want to where we want to go not not where we want to go but how or like at what rate do we want to kind of promote these three aspects i think that's right so what would you guys i mean if the trade what if we really was a trade-off with with um would you be comfortable expanding you know get get rather than starting with healthcare workers and the most vulnerable and going to the general population what if a country really could choose to vaccinate a lot more people if they sort of dropped the prioritization and just got vaccines in as many arms as possible, they get to herd immunity faster. Yeah, how, how much faster would they have to go for that to be sort of ethically or morally appropriate to jump the queue? What's the, 
any sense of what a principal would be? You know, is it like a John Rawls kind of thing? You can do it inequitably so long as it's to the advantage of the most vulnerable, because the most vulnerable will benefit from herd immunity at some point too, right? Is that is that the standard? I don't know. What do you think? Or is it 7.15 at night? It's, I, I, it's okay. I, I, I looks like, I, oh, Lydia, I'm sorry. I get you, get your hand up there too, I'm sorry. Um, well, this is just kind of an instinct and it might be because um, I study math, but I think that um, like the way that I would like think about answering this question would to be kind of like, look at how quickly you could achieve herd immunity, like given a certain rate of like general vaccination versus specific vaccination and then see mm -hmm. like, given like how many people are dying at a certain time period, like which uh, approach would save more people. That was like my initial response was to kind of like use like a mathematical model to see like which would have the overall like net uh, better outcome. Um, but then I, I think, I don't know if this is like why, um, I don't know, I'm not that in far into public health, but like, I think prioritizing healthcare workers is also important because like they're the ones who have been like, you know, at the front lines for like the preceding eight months before um, the vaccine was even available. Um, and so there's also that to take into consideration, which you can't really like put into a model, the fact that like their efforts should also be taken into account. Well, I, I love that. Uh, I love the, the math. Uh, what, what if you did come up with a model that showed that mass vaccination without priority could get you to herd immunity faster and would save more lives overall faster than say the tiered system. But what if the people who died would be different? You know, what if, if, if that go, if, uh, what if you, because we know that the incidence of, of, of death and mor morbidity is, 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 is particularly high for racial minorities, socially marginalized populations, how, how, how would you, how would you factor that in? Yeah, I think that is like where mathematical models do are uh, like uh, not yeah. helpful at all. Cause I don't yeah. think it's possible to like, um, like, I don't think it's possible to put like a scaling factor on like the importance of people's lives. And I don't think that's something that anyone should like try to do. So I think that's where like using a model is bad. Cause if you wanted to say like, we get a thousand deaths in one case, but they're like distributed this way versus 800 deaths in this case distributed like another way um, in order to compare them like from an equity lens, then you'd have to like make like a direct, if you wanted to keep a numerical comparison, like you'd have to create some type of like weighting system of like different groups. And I think that is just not a great thing to do. I don't, yeah, this is out of my area, but I think oh. that that is, oh. would be very hard to do. I mean, I think one thing about pandemics and public health is that it's not out of anyone's area. I agree with you. I don't think that's appropriate, but you can see where this goes, right? It's not a simple trade-off um, and it gets you to really hard questions. Um, so any any other reactions to Bruce? Or how about the any other reactions to Bruce or the subject? Oh, Yuma again, please. Um, yeah, I kind of also wanted to talk about um, what Lydia was just talking about, and I agree with that completely, um, especially how health healthcare workers should especially get it first. But also um, going back to this idea of like just giving it to like the mass population, I think that when it comes to that, we should definitely be prioritizing um, communities who are um, like especially like low income and people of color because. I think that especially when it comes to the United States, there's so much intersections when it comes to um, low income individuals and there being food deserts, um, especially in their communities. And so if it's not going to be COVID, there's also going to be other underlying factors that sort of contribute to their health um, diminishing and them having like how like just having worse conditions. And so if you look at like wealthier populations who are getting the vaccine at that like same rate or even more then they already have um, like the sort of like the community of health um, to their advantage because they have access to healthcare that's at a better rate than those who are in like low income communities. So I think that 
if there's like ever, like if there should ever be a priority, it should be to sort of individuals who don't have access to healthcare at the greater rate than those who do. And especially if they have sort of um, uh, conditions, pre-existing conditions. And then I also kind of wanted to go back to something that Kayla had mentioned about um, healthcare in America, just like the system. And I thought it was interesting how in that first article, it talked about how um, just like the US had like a limited supply chain when it came to like healthcare equipment. And so when we were talking about how, um, how like communities like sometimes like they don't trust the vaccination process, it makes me wonder if like maybe in itself, like it's the government's fault for not like caring enough about sort of healthcare. I don't know if that makes sense, but I thought it was interesting how we have this like limited supply in comparison to how much we could produce. And if that just shows that there isn't that much attention to it and it sort of contributes to why um, people distrust um, vaccines, yeah. Oh, those are two good points. I, I'd say on the, the latter one, I, I, I do think, um, I think your point is a well, ta well taken. The strategic national stockpile, which was referred to in one of the articles, as well as sort of in general our capacity, that, that, that the idea of a stockpile is that events like this could happen, not just pandemics, but hurricanes, natural disasters, where you would need access to PPE and uh, medication, ventilators, you know, sort of, uh, um, I, you know, we have a long history in the United States of underfunding things that are uh, basically low, low risk, high impact events. So, you know, in a, in a political process where you're dividing up the pie, the government every year, there's always, there's a higher priority for something that's high, highly important and immediate need and it's always easier. It's like, I think it's like in all of our lives, it's the, the thing that's not likely to happen, you kind of think, well, I'll, I'll deal with that tomorrow or I'll deal with that next month, right? So what happened with the strategic national stockpiles, it was not routinely updated. It wasn't, um, it wasn't uh, large enough to meet what would be a predictable demand in the event that something like this happened. So I, I think your point's well taken. Um, um, and it's and I, I do I'm hopeful that coming out of this will at least have some political political will members of Congress the president can say you know we really need to invest because we don't ever want to go through this again but I'll be honest with you we've had phases before where like after Ebola or after H1N1 Congress appropriates a lot of money and then the next year it goes away so this sort of cycle of attention and neglect is, is very real um, on your first point, I, I think you, you put your finger on I think Lydia raised the right question. And I think the other way of saying it is, I, I, of course, I agree with you. I think that we should prioritize um, uh, by health workers, by people who are in highly at risk populations. But you got to take that to a logical limit. If, 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 if that slows down the process such that maybe twice as many people die in the country, is if you had done a mass open to all vaccination. Like there's a there's a there's a point, right? I mean, would you stick with it even if it was twice as many people died or 10 times as many? Like you that's the, the hard question here, right? That that's what's that's the uh, the embedded question in these kinds of trade-offs. Uh, and I and I think it's I don't think there's simple answers. I mean that's why you know I, I I agree with you and Lydia that we should do the right thing. But 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 there's a point at which the cost of doing the right thing might be very high in terms of lives, maybe not the lives of people in targeted populations, but overall. And how do you balance that? That's the ethical burden under underlying all of this. And again, I would take you all back to, you know, historically philosophers have sorted this out. I mean, there's, you know, the sort of the classic uh, utilitarian argument, every life's equal, you know, there's a, you know, in, in Lydia's world, there's a, the two equations uh, can, can match and you can decide which, uh, you know, which path has uh, the model is more likely to yield the most lives. Um, or do you take like a Rawlsian view where, you know, you, 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 you shouldn't compound unfairness. But even then, there's a limit to that. You can, 
you know, it, 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 you're not gonna, uh, you, 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 you can only promote inequity to the extent that it benefits the most vulnerable. So anyway, other, other, other people's reactions? Um, I would love your thoughts on format too. Oh, Lydia, jump in. I love having a math. I, we've never had a math student in this class. I love that. Oh, I'm I'm only a math minor. I study biochemistry like as my major, but um, I'm really like recently I've done more like computational modeling and mathematical modeling. So that's like why it's like on my mind, I guess. Um, but anyways, um, the point that I wanted to talk about um, was related to when you brought up how the existing healthcare system might affect people's trust and like current public health efforts like vaccination. Um, and I guess like in more generally, like how the market interacts with healthcare and how that affects hmm. vaccination. So one of the questions that I was um, thinking about was how um, we talked about like how specialized manufacturing is slowing down the production of vaccines, but I was also wondering about like intellectual property mm -hmm. um, and how to balance like the companies that have put big investments into developing the vaccines versus like uh, countries that may be able to start manufacturing them, but don't have the money to pay for like intellectual property rights to manufacture them, even though they could potentially vaccinate more of their population um, otherwise. And like how we balance those two things, I guess, um, was one of my questions. Um, and then the other thing that I was thinking about um, as someone who does like um, more on the like working in the lab, like vaccine development kind of thing, um, I was wondering like what, um, what kind of effect people on that side of the vaccine development have to do with like with people's trust in the vaccine itself. Cause you know, usually you think of scientists as just like being in the lab, not talking to anyone. Um, but I know that like uh, we talked about like how uh, we need to think about trust in like a more holistic way and like on a more personal level. Um, and so I was, as someone who falls into that group, I guess I was thinking about that. Um, I had an interesting conversation with my dental hygienist while I was home over the break um, because she was eligible to be vaccinated um, in, I'm from Georgia and she's eligible, eligible to be vaccinated there, but didn't feel like she was ready to be vaccinated. And so like we talked, I talked with her about it and like on a personal level, I think that because she knew about my background in biochemistry that she like, that's why she was asking me about it, um, about the vaccine and about the vaccine development. So that's one thing that like, I think a lot about like, what could I have said? Like, what did I say? Um, and like, what impact can I have or did I have? Um, so that was my other question. Well, I, I guess on your second question, I would say, um, I, I think, especially for those of you who are going to go into sort of health related careers or but whether it's a, in a lab or a clinical role, I do think you have an outsized influence on how people think about things like vaccines. Um, you know, even, even in this highly polarized environment, scientists and health professionals are still highly trusted. Now, maybe not as much as they were before, but certainly compared to other professionals in society. Um, I, I think, you know, sort of one small example of it is, I, I, I've known Tony Fauci, for example, for, you know, 20 years, you know, from the thought that he is a pop icon now, you know, is is mind boggling to me, but I think it speaks, oh, he's a very great, he's a terrific human being. But I think, I think there is a, a middle ground that science and people who are devoted to science still, but that trust has got to be really carefully managed because you can see the damage, like take the, the damage of, of um, uh, you know, the, the, the Tuskegee experiments or the, um, the, 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 the sterilization campaigns in American Indian communities. I mean, these things happened a long time ago. Not, I mean, not as long as some people like to think, but it, but still a long time ago. And and these I, th those breaches of trust last a long time. So I think it it I think it's smart, Lydia, for you and everybody else here who's thinking of a health career to think really carefully about the influence that you will make in the people you talk to, whether it's your dental hygienist or if you're on a, a, a radio program or just in a, at, at a 
you're having dinner, you know, if you're having dinner with a bunch of poets, they're probably going to be interested in what you think about uh, vaccines more than, than because they, they, they have a sense, you know, what's going on. Um, uh, so I, you know, I think, so I, maybe that's a good place to end because we're at 730, but I, I really hope, oh, one last thought is, did the format work okay for everybody? Any suggestions? Okay. If you have any thoughts, we're on in two weeks. Remember, um, and um, you know, we've, uh, and our next speaker is also a remarkable person, um, uh, uh, Ambassador Gooseby, um, among other things, opened the first AIDS ward at San Francisco General during the beginning of the HIV outbreak, and he's spent a career working in this space and was on President Biden's COVID advisory committee. So anyway, he'll be another fascinating person to talk to uh, through these issues. So any other any other final thoughts? Um, I'm happy to stick around afterward if anybody still has any other questions. And, and Jackie too, Jacqueline, I, we should, um, I want to be sure that um, I go back and check if I don't have your email, I want to figure out why I didn't get it, okay? Um, anything else? All right, I'll let you guys go. You've had a long day of Zoom, all righty. Thanks for doing this. This will be fun. <laughs>